Let's uh, now turn to hear the Word of God. We have it before us in Ephesians chapter 5. And I think we'll um, pick the reading up. Yeah, we'll go back into chapter 4, in fact, and read from verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath come on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. And we thank our God for this, his word to us again this evening. And we've got to know these verses so very well uh, over these last number of weeks. But let's now pray to God, asking for that help that only can come from him as we study together this evening. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that indeed you are our Father. We thank you for that wonderful picture of being a child of the living God. Thank you that you have adopted us uh, into your family and that we can be confident of you being Abba, Father to us. We're also very thankful that we can be confident and unashamed on that day that you will come because we will know that the work that you have begun in us all those years ago will have brought the fruit that you have desired. Oh, help us, Father, to be easy to work with, easy to work in, that we will indeed cooperate with the Word and the Spirit of God and that you will touch our hearts and touch our lives. And as we've been thinking about over these days, over these weeks, may we indeed be continually putting off the old self, which is corrupted by deceitful desires, that we may be indeed putting on the new self, 
created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And we pray that we will be people who speak truth, not lies. That we will be people who will be angry in a right and good way, not in a bad way. We pray too that we will not be people who steal from you or from others, but that we will be hard workers and generous givers. We pray that we will not let any unwholesome, saparos talk come out of our mouths, but only that which is good for building others up according to their needs. And we pray too that being filled with the Spirit, we will not grieve him, but that we will get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander and every form of malice. And instead, like God himself, we will be kind and compassionate. And so we will be able to forgive each other just as we have been forgiven. In all of this, Father, we know that we are imitators of God. And we pray that you will help us do that to imitate our God and our Father. And tonight, as we think about sexual immorality and all kinds of impurity, help us to be honest and help us to deal with this devastating sin that can wreck families and marriages and churches. Father, speak to us and help us to be honest and help us to know your leading and your guiding. You are a good, good God and we thank you now that you will bless us as we study these words together because we're asking for your help. We know that you'll give it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've got a Bible, please open at Ephesians 5. Now, I'm sure we're all aware that life is full of pressures and all kinds of problems. There are challenges on one hand, and yet joys on the other hand. Heartaches and triumphs, confusions and illuminations. It is a a crazy, mixed-up world in which we live. And I would suggest to you that a major part of Scripture is making sense of it all. Making sense of it all. How to handle life properly. We don't come to church to have a massive group huddle now, do we? We don't come to church to enjoy that nice feel-good atmosphere. We don't come to church to experience the power of positive thinking so that we can just manage to hold on to our faith for another week. That somehow coming together just gives us that little bit of boost of energy, the boost of spiritual energy to hang on because everything's against us and everyone's against us. That's not why we come to church. We come here to glorify and worship God and to be equipped to handle life properly, biblically, and spiritually. I like what Ray Steadman says. Ray Steadman many years ago said this. The purpose of the church is not to make the world a better place to live in. It is to make a better people to live in the world. The purpose of the church is not to make the world a better place to live in. It is to make a better people to live in the world. Now, the byproduct, of course, is that the world should become a better place, but only after people are made better. So we have the secret of life. And we need to learn that secret and practice that secret and share that secret. Now, some would accuse us of being arrogant and conceited when we say that we have um, the secret of life, but it's very biblical. And it really goes back to those verses that we began uh, our reading with this evening. Put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires. In verse 24, put on the new self. So we put off, we put on. And the five areas of life that we've looked at can cause such devastation. If we could just learn the secret of life, we would deal with those five areas and others besides that scripture covers so that they will not enter into our lives, they will not enter our living, they won't enter into our families, they won't enter into our church. 
I mean, these five areas are cause devastation because they're common in the world, and sadly, they're too common in the church. So what are they? Well, let's remind ourselves. We've, we've read it. We've prayed it. But put off falsehood and put on truthfulness, verse 25. Put off unrighteous anger and put on righteous anger, verse 26 and 27. Of course, we've got to be very careful with that one because we might give the devil a foothold in our lives or families or churches. The third one is put off stealing and put on hard work and generosity, verse 28. 29, put off unwholesome talk and put on what is helpful for building others up. Put off bitterness and rage and anger, brawling, slander and malice. Put on kindness, compassion and forgiveness right at the end of chapter 4. These are the principles of new life. This is the way to live. This is the way for God's people to live. But I think there's one more. Now, some disagree, but I think there is. I think it's there in chapter 5. And I think, and I've got to keep checking that everything's up there. It's not, they are. So I'm now hopefully going to be um, uh, in tune with what's behind me. If I'm not, would some kind person let me know? But I think we've got to put off, put on, and reason here in this section that's before us. Put off sexual immorality, verses 3 and 4. Put on the life of love, verse 1 and 2. And the reason is there in verses 5 to 7. Now, I think there's a really good reason why Paul puts the, the uh, put on that first, which we'll get to right at the end. And if I'm right, then I'm right. If I'm wrong, then I'm sure I will be forgiven. But I think we need to be re- reformed in all these areas that we've looked at already over these weeks, but especially this one. This is a biggie. Sexual immorality causes devastation all over the place, even in the church. As I think back to the chaos, the devastation that sexual immorality has brought even to people that we've known and loved here in this church. Broken homes, damaged children, shipwrecked faith. Relationships have been destroyed, trust broken. Sexual immorality has a tremendous price inflicted upon our society. Do you know that one of the major reasons for the growing abortion rate right across our land and our world is to do with sexual immorality? Sexual immorality causes such strains on our holiness, our homes and our marriages. Because of this sin, we can have loveless homes and trustless marriages. Such devastation. It was common in Paul's day and it's common in our day. Now the original readers lived in the notorious, sinful port city of Ephesus. It was wicked. It was decadent. Uh, We think things are bad now. Well, probably they weren't much better then in that particular city as in other cities like Corinth. Sex, women, children, relationships, truth, money, all were misused and abused. The dominant religion of the day was the worship of Diana. And part of the practice of this religion was ritual prostitution in the temple built to her honor. And sexual perversion was accepted as valid and even exalted. It was backed by business because it was good for business, you can imagine. And it was backed by the religious elite as they sought to promote it. And the Ephesians were told from youth that sexual perversion was okay, it was normal, it was healthy. Don't suppress your sexual desires, they were told. Satisfy your sexual desires, whatever way you want, whenever you want, with whoever you want. Ding. Does that not sound very, very contemporary? Perverted love, sexual immorality, is Satan's gift to the world and how the world loves this perverted love. And sadly, we Christians are not exempt from temptation to fall for that love. Hence the warning, put off and put on. You see, we're made in the image of God and that means, you know, um, Sex is his creation. Marriage is his creation. Gender is his creation. 
rules about all these things in the Bible are his creation. Read Genesis 2. Read Song of Songs. Read the teachings of Paul. And other parts of Scripture will go and be well taught about sexual morality. See, in here in the church, we're told what God expects of us. But out there in the world, we're told you can do whatever you like, basically. The world says you are entitled. You have the right. You're almost obligated to satisfy your desires. But as we see, God has a different point of view. One of two main headings here, purity and and reason, looking at three and four, uh, and then five and seven, and then going back to one and two at the end. But there we are. I I have to throw it all there up for you so you can see where we go. First of all, purity, verses three and four. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. So all types of sexual immorality are forbidden. All types. Look at the language used here. There must not be even a hint, not even a hint, any kind of impurity. These things are improper for God's holy people. And notice the three areas that Paul deals with. Um, the physical sin, the thinking sin, the speech sin. He deals with all three areas in these two verses. Now, we ought to love God's way and enjoy sex God's way. He's given us tremendous freedom within limits to enjoy these things. It's crazy that Christians should be accused of being anti-sex. That makes as much sense as saying Christians are anti-food or anti talking or anti-breathing or any other good gift that God has given to us to enjoy. The problem is, by nature, we will take these good gifts and abuse them. So let's think of these, um, these words that are important. There, we've, we've got them. There's, there's really six words that we want to look at. Immorality. That means sexual sin, sex before marriage or outside of marriage. And Paul says, not even a hint. There must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. Impurity is a more general term that refers to immoral thoughts. So we're moving from the action to the thinking. Passions, ideas that we dream up in our heads. The word there, impurity, actually means dirty or impure. It was often used to refer to the pus around an infected wound. It's disgusting, isn't it? That kind of, yeah, you can picture it. I don't need to graphically describe it. So immorality is the physical act. Impurity is thinking about it. And so is greed. Covetousness is another word. I think the ESV uses covetousness, or some translations certainly do. The idea of lusting. Wanting, desiring more and more different than what God has given to us. And the idea is that I want, I deserve. That's what the world says to you. You deserve this. You can have this. In fact, the world says you need this. This consuming urge. I need it. I want it. I'm going to get it. It's sinful pleasure thinking apart from God. And Paul said, not even a hint of this should be in your life. But among you, God's people, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. See, Satan's counterfeit love is offered to us on a plate. And it's so intoxicating and seducing. See, the real problem with covetousness or greed, wanting something that we do not have at present, is it's really a complaint against God, who is sovereign and who provides. He's given you the position that you have, whether you're married or not married, whether you're young or whether you're old. 
whatever your situation is in life, God is sovereign in that situation. God has placed you in that situation. And if you want something more than that, that's outside the will of God, that's covetousness. That's greed. That's sin. So we've got physical, we've got mental, and then in verse 4 we've got verbal. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. So the, the warning continues about what the world wants and what the world chases and what the world is offered freely from Satan's pit. And again, three words here, obscenity, dirty speech, foolish talk, which is idiotic, stupid speaking, and coarse joking, which is pointed innuendo, suggestive talk. I mean, I mean can we listen to anybody with a, any kind of sense of humor nowadays and, 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 you know, on TV when there isn't you know, innuendo, suggestive talk? It's sub-Christian. And it's extremely damaging to our purity and to our holiness and to our wives or husbands or to our boyfriends or girlfriends. And I, some of you might be saying, oh, this is not a wee bit petty, you know. What's wrong with a bit of funny talk? Hey, McNeely, you, you of all people, you like a bit of crack, a bit of fun. And there's nothing wrong with fun. A sense of humor is good. But coarse joking, foolish talk obscenity is dangerous. Why? I think as Brian Chappell said, because we see what we say and then we do what we say. I think that's very important. We see what we say and then we do what we say. There's a bit of a slippery slope danger here. Satan knows exactly what he's doing. We lower our inhibitions and say, oh, you know, I'd never do that, but hey, let's talk about it. I would never do that, but let's think about it. Slowly but surely, we think and we speak in a non-God-honoring way, and one step at a time, the slippery slope is entered onto, and loose thoughts, loose words, loose actions... I don't think anybody ever sets out, or very few Christians would ever set out, for instance, to commit adultery. But it all begins with a thought that's improper, or perhaps an improper word that leads to improper actions. But isn't God good? He, he tells us what really what our talking um, should be used for at the end of verse 4, but rather thanksgiving. Notice that there at the end of verse 4? This is what our talking should be in, engaged in. Thanksgiving. And what we can say is, whoever we are, can I tell you, whoever we are tonight, whatever situation we're in, we can say, thank you, God, for the situation I'm in. Thank you, God, that I am married. Or thank you, God, that I'm single. Yes. Yes. That doesn't mean that if you're single, it's wrong for you to want to be married. But you've got to be able to say, I'm thankful for the position that I am in right now. I, I'm thankful for your sovereign rule over my life, Lord God. I am thankful for your providential care to me. I am thankful for the word of God which leads me and explains to me about holiness. I am thankful for the Holy Spirit who enables me to be holy in an unholy world. I am thankful for the cross, the example of pure love. I am thankful for the church where I have brothers and sisters who will help me in the battle against the flesh. Uh, thankfulness, you see, is a powerful weapon against sexual immorality. He is in control. Yes, he has provided. He has spoken, and we are thankful. And we have sufficient help and truth and power, and, and we're called to a brand new lifestyle, different to the world, better than the world, safer than the world. And so in many ways we've... Um, and this is so good to have so many young people here tonight. 
There's two kinds of love and offer to you young people, and there is to me an old man. There's God's love, which is sacrificial and giving, and there's Satan's love, which is unsatisfying and lustful. And we've got to decide, which love do we want? Which love are we going to give ourselves to? There's only really one. So that's purity. And then we've got the reason for, for this. Now, verse 5 may seem severe. Yeah, it's not easy to read. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, but because of such words, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. If we have a low view of sin, and we're very accepting of what's going on in the world, then this will appear to be severe. But what we've got to acknowledge is Scripture is consistent and clear. If we had time, we would read um, passages like, uh, in fact, we do have time, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither sexually immoral or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. You can read the same in Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21, and also in 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 to 10, and in other places too. And what the Bible says that no continually practicing sinner, no unrepentant sensualist has eternal life. There is no inheritance for such people. They're described as them in verse 7. We'll, we'll get to that in a few moments. Because what they have done, and you'll notice in verse 5, such a man is an idolater, they're making sexual sin God. Do you notice that? For this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. If you give yourself to these things, and they are the source of joy and contentment, and you chase after these things to get the satisfaction that you long for, that we all long for, then you have made that sin, or sins, God. And therefore you can have no part of his kingdom. No part of his kingdom. Now, do Christians fall into these sins from time to time? Of course they do. I stand guilty before you of these things. Don't you think for one moment that I'm not. I'm guilty in thinking. But true Christians will not persist in these sins. And that's the difference. Repentant sinners are forgiven. Unrepentant sinners are forgiven. Unforgiven. Now, verse 5 therefore refers to deliberately chosen lifestyles of disobedience by unbelievers. But verse 6, in many ways, it actually gets worse. Let no one deceive you with these uh, empty words. For, such, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. S such people face the wrath of God. It's not just an Old Testament idea, this, of course, this wrath of God. I mean, Jesus talked more about the wrath of God than anyone else. Even in John 3, 16, the verse that so many people like to quote, he says, the people who believe will not perish. And, of course, those who don't believe will perish. God's people get eternal life by grace. Unsaved people don't. See, the sexual immoral lifestyle that so many in our world are choosing is a religion, not of God. And it will result in not being part of the kingdom of Christ and of God, verse 5. And it will result in facing the wrath of God, verse 6. Now you may be saying, ah, where's grace in all of this? Where is the grace in all of this? Well, the grace in all of this is all over the place. Grace is the fact that he's warning us. 
that he's warning the young people here this evening and old people like me. If this is what's going to happen to the sexually immoral who have chosen this, what's going to happen to you if, if you actually show that you're not really part of God's people at all because you're following a false God? So he tells us, repent. And he speaks to the world through us. This is supposed to be our message. Difficult as it is. But verse 6, notice, let no one deceive you with these empty words. There are so many deceivers who deceive with their empty words around us. And they spew out their uh, empty words. Lies, falsehoods, denial of truth. The media is full of it. Be yourself, they say. As long as you're happy, they say. You deserve it, they say. Express yourself. And rules, ha, that's very last season. That's Victorian. Freedom is for today. And to all of this, God says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. And then verse 7, therefore do not be partners with them. We must not join them. We must remain faithful to God. We must risk ostracism. And I think what really Paul is saying here is that um, we don't need friends like this. Again, we've got to be careful who we partner with, who we spend time with. We must be forgiven people, yes, and then we must live like forgiven children of God. I have failed here. Can I be forgiven? How can I be forgiven? How can any of us be forgiven? Jesus says, because of my death, you can and you will be forgiven. But you see, when we sin... It's almost as, as if, if you can imagine this picture in your mind. I remember hearing this some years ago when it, it's never left my mind. It's like as if we were climbing over the cross of Jesus. And we're almost saying, Jesus, get out of my way. Just get out of my way. I just want to get at my sin. I just want to satisfy my lusts. Just let me at my sin. Now, when you think of it in those terms... It's disgusting, isn't it? There he is dying for our sin. And we want to crawl over the top of him to get to our sin. But he loves us. And he loves to forgive. And he offers me and you that forgiveness. Therefore, do not be partners with them. That word them is very important there. Them refers to the unrepentant sinners committed to an ungodly lifestyle. They have no intention of listening to God or following God. They have made up their mind. This is our religion. This is our freedom. This is what we're going to do. Them. And I think the key thing is, is what Paul is saying here. He says, that is not who you are. This is not who you are. You were made for better. You are made for greater. Don't live that way. Don't act that way. Now, verse 8 gives us a big clue to who we are. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. But that's next study, which will be after Christmas. You're going to have to wait for that. But you can read ahead and read it and reread it and reread it. That's who we are, the children of light. We don't live like that anymore but look back to verses 1 and 2 because I think there Paul is giving us reasons why we should not live the way the world lives 
Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Who are you tonight? Let's think of them today. You're not them, he says. You're not them. You're not the them of verses 5 and verses 6. Think, who are you? Who are you? Well, you are dearly loved children, verse 1. You are the children or the people loved by Christ, verse 2. See, this is the reality of our relationship that leads us to holiness. Savor your identity. You're the beloved of God. You're the beloved of Christ. And the order, by the way, is so very, very important here. Paul doesn't say, or God doesn't say to us through Paul, I will love you if you live a life of love. I will love you if you imitate God. No. He says, as dearly loved children, be imitators of God. He says, just as Christ loved us, live a life of love. See, the relationship comes first. Our identity leads to our activity. It's not our activity leading to our identity. So again, let's be very clear. God is not saying to us, get your life in order, then you will be my child. No, he's saying, you are my child, so live your life in order. Brian Chappell again uh, says, we often confuse our who and our do. We think what we do will establish who we are. And the gospel says who we are establishes what we do. Now, that may sound complicated, but actually think about it. We, th we think what we do will establish who we are, but actually who we are establishes what we do. So before God tells us to avoid sexual immorality in act and thought and speech, he tells us why. He says, you are my dearly loved children. You are loved by my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he warns us about the danger of exclusion from the kingdom of Christ. Yes, he warns us about facing the wrath of God if we show ourselves, in fact, not to be his dearly loved children. But he begins with our true identity as his true people. It's our identity as his children that leads to our holy activity. It is who we are that leads to what we do. That's why verses 1 and 2 is where it is, and 3 and 4 is where it is. Do not sin, he says, because I love you. Do not sin, because Jesus loves you. Yep, sexual immorality is another weapon of mass destruction. We have seen it all around us. The sad reality is that there could be someone even in this building tonight who might become a victim. Remember who you are in him and for him to do the right things. Verse 1 tells us, be imitators of God. So as we conclude, let's think about imitating the God-man who came at Christmas, the Lord Jesus Christ. He never obsessed with lust. He never uttered an obscenity. No foolish or vulgar talk came from his lips. No coarse joking. He never lied, if you want to go further into chapter 4. He never lost his temper in an unrighteous way. He never misused speech. He never stole. He never hated. Imitate him, our Savior. He was pure. He was giving. He was sacrificial love. Too much for us? Yeah, it is, because we are... We are children of this dark age, aren't we? We are children shaped by the world more than we possibly think. But when we have his spirit, when we have his salvation, 
we can imitate him. The world says, be free, express yourself. We need to be free to love in a pure and holy way. In Christ, we can be free. In his grace, we can be free. One of my favorite preachers said this. He says, almost like in a prayer at the end of a sermon, he says, God, take, take over my actions. Take over my thoughts. Take over my speech. And then one day, take me home. That's a good pray, prayer to pray, is it not? Lord, take over my actions, thoughts, and speech, and then one day, take me home. Father, we thank you that you've warned us again of another weapon of mass destruction. And we fear for the world around us. So many people we know and love who have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God, so many people we know and love who are facing God's wrath. But for, you, for us, your people, dearly loved children, loved by Christ, saved by Christ, and dwelt by his Spirit, we have such hope.